Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Mythbusters, Uncovering Truths About Behavioral Health Crisis Care. Today, we're embarking on session two, Admissions and Defining Crisis. My name is Miranda Green, and I'm a clinical consultant with TVD Solutions and a member of the Crisis Residential Association. Today's panel will be recorded and linked to the recording, as well as the slide deck will be made available to all registered participants. More details about how to obtain the recording and the slides will be shared at the conclusion of the webinar. A little bit of housekeeping. Um, all attendees' cameras and microphones are disabled for the duration of the webinar. We encourage everyone to engage within the chat feature. So if you have not yet, please try to test that out by chatting your name and location. We'll be monitoring the questions. So any questions answered into the Q&A box um, will be reviewed by those moderating today's event. Now onto the good stuff. So today's panel is hosted by TBD Solutions. TBD Solutions is a Michigan-based behavioral health consulting organization. The company's core expertise represents a rich background in research, organizational leadership, healthcare policy analysis, strategic planning, process refinement, facilitation services, outcomes management systems, training, quality improvement, and technology-based analytic and visualization solutions. TBD Solutions has a unique specialty in crisis system design, development, and measurement. TBD Solutions is committed to collaborating with communities to identify and adapt to unique challenges, solving problems that will improve behavioral health crisis services for persons served. We would also like to give a very big thank you to those organizations supporting today's event. First is Crisis Residential Association. The CRA exists to support the operational and clinical functions of crisis residential programs around the world. Rooted in the values of empathy, recovery, and continuous improvement, the association seeks to connect providers with the best ideas in behavioral health treatment to transform the way people receive mental health care. Also, thank you to National Organization of Crisis Organization Direct Directors, also known as NASCAD. NASCAD is an organization for social service professionals serving as executive directors or program directors for crisis organizations. NASCAD's mission is to provide support and professional development for executive directors and program managers. They arrange trainings, promote professional development, serve as advocates, and provide other appropriate services. Thank you to the American Association of Suicidology, or AAS, who exists to promote the understanding and prevention of suicide and support those who have been affected by it. AAS is an inclusive community that envisions a world where people know how to prevent suicide and find hope and healing. And finally, a big thank you to the International Council for Helplines, formerly known as Contact USA. The International Council for Helplines is a helpline membership organization with a mission to inspire, educate, and accredit helpline programs which offer support to individuals in crisis and emotional distress. Their vision is that anyone at any time has access to thriving, effective emotional support. ICH promotes unconditional regard for acceptance of all people. Thank you all for making today possible. I'm now gonna turn it over to our moderator, Travis Atkinson. Travis has worked in the behavioral health field for the past 15 years. He's a fierce advocate for efficient, equitable, and cost-effective emergency psychiatric care. Travis has partnered with providers and payers across the country to find meaningful solutions to some of healthcare's most challenging issues. Travis has sought out opportunities to infuse mental health treatment and music, bringing musical self-expression groups into psychiatric hospitals and crisis facilities. A native Michigander, he enjoys writing and performing music, coaching his daughter's basketball teams, attending concerts, and stacking pills in the original Nintendo's Dr. Mario. He's traveled to 47 of the 50 states, and he hopes to one day perfect the two-fingered whistle. Travis received his BS in psychology from U of M and his MS in human services and counseling from National Louis University. He lives in Grand Rapids, Michigan with his wife and three daughters. Thank you, Miranda. Um, good afternoon to some of you. Good morning to others. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be with you here again uh, talking about crisis services and how um, how to understand some of the nuances that exist in these services. And I'm very excited to be joined by uh, our wonderful panel, who I will introduce in just a moment. Um, so as I, for, for those of you that uh, joined us uh, a few weeks ago for our first webinar, we talked about this idea that we are all on a journey here together. 
Um, and we are trying to answer this question of how can we be the most helpful? How can we help someone in their time of greatest need or in their darkest hour? Um, and that leads us to a number of questions that go beyond just doing the, the crisis work from day to day, but it, but it asks about how we do that work, um, maybe why we do that work or, or what our blind spots are as we're doing this work. And so today we're going to be talking about um, just the definition of, of what constitutes a crisis um, and admissions procedures and, and the thought behind those approaches. Um, and so I wanna start by, by just getting to something that has been debated a lot in the last few years, which is this idea of what is included in a crisis continuum, okay? And I found uh, this, this information, which I think uh, provides one good example or one approach. It says the continuum of crisis services as presented in this document is comprised of four major components, crisis telephone services, walk-in crisis intervention services, mobile crisis outreach services, and crisis residential services. Now you might see this and think, gosh, this probably came from uh, some kind of type of monograph or report that came out in, uh, you know, in the last few years that's kind of taken its own angle about what to do. And this is actually from uh, a, a, a report, uh, a, pay, a, a large um, uh, report that was written for the National Institute for Mental Health, but it was actually written in 1987. And I think that that can tell us uh, that we are sometimes just rediscovering old ideas um, or that to, to, to use a phrase out of the book of Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament, there is nothing new under the sun. And if we are not creating the latest and greatest and the best thing, but we can actually learn from the past and learn from the people who have thought through these ideas before, um, maybe the answers are um, more simple than we realize that they are. So there are other ways that we've been absorbing this information about what constitutes a crisis or, or what our sources are for information. And these are just a couple of monographs that have been published in the last, um, gosh, about 15 years now, 15 or 16 years. It's tough when you look at a, at a number of the early 2000s and you're like, that was 15 years ago or more. Um, but uh, even most recently, the, the group for the advancement of psychiatry uh, had posted this roadmap to the ideal crisis system that was published uh, along with the National Council for Behavioral Healthcare um, in the last month or so. It's hard to know what to believe and what to follow. And we have to remember that our instinct as humans sometimes is to chase the shiny object, okay? To think we, um, you know, th this, this, this new idea, this new model promises better outcomes or it promises a bright and hopeful future. Um, but what we're trying to do in this webinar series is to take the approach um, of, of sound crisis care and make sure that it's rooted in two things. One is practice-based evidence. This idea that our crisis providers are experts in what they do. Some of them have been doing it for 50 years or more, and they have gotten a sense for what the community needs and how to be the most helpful. And that's why we have uh, providers today on this panel talking about these issues. And the other side is evidence-based practice, that there is research behind crisis services that goes back 40 or 50 years that says, here is what we know to be helpful in controlled trials, or here is what we've seen to be promising. So the four aspects that we're gonna talk about today, the four crisis services that are kind of represented uh, on our call are crisis call centers, um, which um, sometimes are referred to as suicide prevention hotlines, mobile crisis teams, so uh, groups of clinicians and peers or clinicians and, and bachelor's level professionals uh, who go out into the community to try and deescalate a mental health crisis, uh, crisis residential services. So this is considered a home-like environment that's an alternative to psychiatric hospitalization and then peer respite facilities. Uh, so these would look similar to crisis residential, except they're entirely staffed or operated by people with lived experience with mental health or addiction. So um, we are going to just take a quick look at, at how many of these services there are in the United States, uh, because we don't have a lot of 
of great sources to tell us that. Uh, crisis, crisis services and, and, this, and the standards or the hopeful standards around these services, it's very fragmented. It's very difficult to, uh, to know what the landscape looks like, but we want to help a little bit so that we can show what the prevalence is of these services as we get into these conversations. So there are about 800 crisis call centers in the United States. There are also about 800 crisis residential programs in the United States. There's about 500 mobile crisis teams, uh, about 125, excuse me, 175 23 hour crisis stabilization units or psychiatric urgent care centers. Every state calls them something different. And then lastly, about 70 peer respite facilities. Uh, so hopefully this gives you a sense of, of, of you know, just just how broad these services are. Um, you know, if you add all these up, we're talking about probably a few thousand, over 2,000 of these different types of crisis services. Um, so I'm very happy now, though, to introduce our panelists for today. Um, and the first is, uh, let me just move my screen around, make sure I can read things, uh, is Donna Olson Salas. Uh, Donna is the program director at the Harris Center for Mental Health and IDD. Um, Donna has been in the mental health field as a licensed social worker for 30 years. She received her MSW at the University of Houston Graduate College of Social Work. She's a licensed clinical social worker in the state of Texas and has been in both clinical and management positions, working with individuals, families, and groups of persons with intellectual developmental disabilities, as well as mental health and grief support services. She currently directs a crisis residential facility in Houston, part of the Harris Center for Mental Health and IDD. Alex Thomas is the manager of the Wellness and Recovery Center, one of the first peer-run mental health respite centers in Ohio. With a passion for community mental health and the power of lived experience, Alex has made Toledo home for the last seven years, completing her bachelor's degree at the University of Toledo and currently working to complete a master's in counseling education. Woo -woo. Uh, Alex sits on the board of the directors of the Crisis Residential Association, the Lucas County Suicide Prevention Coalition, and the Warren Senior Resource Center. Welcome, Alex. And lastly, we have Drew Martell. Uh, Drew is the Director of Crisis Services at Foundation 2 in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, where he oversees crisis services operations, which includes a 24-7 crisis line and mobile crisis outreach programming. Drew has been involved in the development and expansion of several crisis programs, including a co-responder model, operation of a statewide crisis line, and care coordination for Iowa's Zero Suicide Initiative. Uh, Drew has presented at the American Association of Suicide Allergies National Conference several times and is also an AAS site surveyor. So uh, just to show you where all of our um, panelists are, are from here today, uh, sometimes if you live in different parts of the country, you're like, where is that state again? Um, this can hopefully orient everyone. So I would invite our panelists to uh, share your video and unmute yourselves and we will dive right in. So welcome, uh, Drew and Donna and Alex. All right, so I'm gonna go in the order that I introduced you to ask this first question, which is what crisis services do you provide and who is eligible to access your services. So Donna, would you mind uh, starting for us and, and tell us, telling us a little bit about crisis services at the Harris Center? Um, crisis services, comprehensive uh, psychiatric services are pretty varied. We uh, are a large organization. We contract with the state of Texas and we also have you know, contracts with federal government, the county government, the city uh, for a variety of things. My area particularly is the crisis residential unit. And there are two of those locations here in Houston, um, but there are also a couple of other um, residential programs. Uh, the hospital to home is our newest uh, residential program and it serves people typically coming out of a psychiatric hospital and going into the to the residence um, and they stay there for a period of maybe a month maybe a little bit longer so that they're trying to get transitioned into the community getting assistance in housing um, maybe some skills in um, in work-related kinds of activities and such. We do have a peers house, which is run by persons with lived experience. Um, they 
take direct uh, calls from the person who needs a little bit of respite care and will come in for a few days for some assistance, just a, a bit of a break. Um, then we have a couple of other programs that our crisis stabilization unit, our CSU, is part of our um, uh, our hospital-based, I guess you could say, uh, services. And so people might be there for a couple of days until they are either ready to go back into the community or they might get moved on to one of our residences. The CRUs, the Crisis Residential Units, are housed at two, two separate locations and they are both pretty much based around the same uh, same model, <coughs> excuse me, same model, but um, different in, in the in the sense that one is a uh, an very open area with rooms all around it so that people can come in uh, and be observed almost the entire time by the techs who are there. They get services throughout the day in groups and individual kinds of set, uh, services. They have a We've got a doctor who's there, nurses, uh, just a, a wide variety of residential kinds of things, helping people transition eventually back into the community. Um, and the other program, the other unit, is uh, more of a, a individual apartments without the the food that they can create themselves. I mean, they they eat in a common area, um, but it's a, a little bit different. With it has to be a little bit more independent because we don't have eyes on everybody at the same time. You can't just look up and see, you know, the whole area there. But same things. We've got groups going on, individual services, doctor, nurses, and with both programs, what our goal is to you know help somebody stabilize after they've been in a more uh, intensive environment, maybe a hospital or or the uh, crisis stabilization unit, or uh, or trying to keep from going into one of those programs, and so they may come to us for a couple up to a couple of weeks, uh, up to ten days, two weeks, something like that. And the care coordinators are working with them on how to get back uh, the skill level back into their into their environment that they need to be. We we have some limitations now because of the COVID, so we don't have a lot of back and forth, in and out kinds of stuff. But we are doing our best to you know keep people moving on to their next step. That's just kind of an overview. Donna, I love the services of the Harris Center, and I've seen some of your colleagues, uh, past and present, um, uh, speak at conferences. Um, and I know we're just in the introductions part, but I don't know where else I'll get this in. I just want to highlight one really cool thing that I've heard about y'all's programs, and that is the alumni uh, effort and this Thanksgiving uh, meal. Can you just tell us about that briefly? Um, the alumni program was started at the same time that we started our first uh, CRU and it was because a lot of folks who have transitioned out of the CRU really don't have a, a connection except perhaps they might we hope that they're involved with the um, ongoing care through the psychiatric clinics or, or case management but this is a place for them to come back for socialization for kind of a check up on on how they're doing with their plan um, they can see the the therapist they can participate in the groups the uh, annual Thanksgiving meal unfortunately this last year we had to you know suspend that um, just because we're trying to limit some of those kinds of um, contacts uh, but the staff uh, all the the staff's families come in and invite all of the alumni who've been part of the the program in the past to come in and share a meal at Thanksgiving time to just really enjoy that family type environment on a much larger scale of course but to be part of something that's that is um, warm and friendly and welcoming so it's it's a really cool thing that we can do and hoping to get back to that soon but you know we'll We'll see. We're we're positive it's going to happen, but just not quite yet. Thank you, Donna. And and uh, and for those of you, for audience members who heard a a number of crisis services that Donna listed off, I think it's safe to say that where some communities outside of Texas have one or two crisis levels of care, uh, a lot of the LMHAs in Texas have three or four or more. So we heard we heard respite there with peers. We heard crisis stabilization unit, crisis residential unit. Um, that's real. The, the, some of the services in in Texas are are much more um, expansive, and there's a much broader continuum in communities like uh, like uh, the like like uh, Harris County. So thank you, Donna. 
Uh, next, uh, Alex, same question to you. Um, tell us a little bit about the services that um, are provided at uh, the Wellness and Recovery Center or how that fits into uh, what's happening at your parent organization, Neighborhood Properties. <laughs> thank you, um, and thank you for having me today. Um, welcome everybody, and I'm really glad um, everyone was able to join so we could talk about our programs. So the Wellness and Recovery Center um, is a peer respite model of care. Um, which is new to our county, Lucas County, um, and new to our state of Ohio. Um, where we fall on the crisis continuum is we're actually that step ahead of a crisis. So we are that program that community members can um, reach out to if they feel like um, they're headed down a, a bad path. Um, some individuals who have experienced psychiatric crises before, you know what that looks like, um, but there are other community members who don't know what that looks like. Um, and so we are really here to educate the community and interact with individuals before they have reached the need for some sort of inpatient psychiatric services or crisis stabilization. Um, ideally, we, all of the peer staff, including myself, um, interact with the community member um, with a person-centered approach, kind of meeting them where they are to really engage with them about how they're feeling um, and explore why they may be feeling that way and some of the barriers to getting to a better place. Um, and the goal is to do that before there's a need for some sort of inpatient um, hospitalization or stabilization. Um, obviously, from a program perspective and a community-based perspective, that's a value and that it saves community dollars on the cost of emergency psychiatric care and or um, drug or alcohol treatment. We do also work with individuals who are um, exploring sobriety or who are sober and maybe feeling you know, concerns of relapse around anniversary dates that we know of or um, just traumatic things that have happened to them. Um, so we also work with community in that way. Um, but we use our own experiences to just interact with the community member and help them um, explore ways in which they can improve their mental health um, and and consistently improve their mental health and explore ways of coping with those things and really turning them around in the right direction. We do a lot of work with the community about identifying what their needs are. There's so many people who don't understand that the signs of a crisis happen before the crisis comes. So, um, you know, for certain individuals, you know, you may be losing sleep or not falling asleep, or, you know, you notice that you're, you're, Fight, you're fighting with your family or your friends a little bit more. You're seeing an increase um, in, in your interactions. Those could be signs of a crisis ahead. And so if we can interact with you and teach you what those look like and try to develop some sort of plan um, to turn you back around in the right direction or to intervene, um, then you know we might be able to make a difference and save the need for um, psychiatric emergency services. In Lucas County, uh, we're, we're working really hard to improve our emergency services, um, and the Wellness Center was an added piece to that plan. Um, the other thing that the Wellness Center does that I did not mention in my um, bio is we also have the emotional support line now. Um, so we started that last year. Um, as a result of the pandemic, we wanted to provide community members with an outlet to just talk about how they were feeling um, in a relaxed and almost informal way, as if they would just be talking to a friend without the fear of talking to a friend, maybe um, without the fear of giving information that you're not comfortable with um, talking to somebody in, in your life. You have that confidentiality piece with us. Um, so we have the emotional support line now, which is also known as a warm line um, in other communities. Um, so the Wellness Center staff, we do own and operate that also. Um, one of the other benefits of the Wellness and Recovery Center that I love so much, and it brings it back to the community-based service, is that our funding um, comes from community tax dollars. Um, it comes from the local mental health and recovery services board that has been extremely supportive of this model and of um, new and progressive ways of responding to um, psychiatric crises. And um, so our funding comes from community dollars, from tax dollars, which makes our services at no charge to community members. We don't require insurance information. We don't require any kind of donation or financial contribution to receive our services. So we really tried to eliminate as many barriers as possible so that we could serve as many people as we could. Thank you, Alex, that's fantastic. Uh, and uh, Drew, tell us about Foundation 2 Crisis Services. 
Hi, and uh, Travis, thanks for having us today. I'm Drew Martell with Foundation Two Crisis Services here in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, where we are enjoying a lovely fall day. Um, so Foundation Two uh, provides several core crisis services, including um, crisis, crisis line, mobile crisis outreach. Uh, we've been providing those services since the 1970s, um, and as well as training throughout our community on suicide prevention and suicide intervention. Um, next slide, please. Um, so uh, Foundation Two operates a, uh, a crisis line. We answer the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, as well as uh, uh, Iowa has a, a statewide crisis line called Your Life Iowa. And then uh, we also answer several other um, kind of local crisis lines. Iowa has this regional system where counties are, are broken to mental health regions. So it's basically counties that are lumped together. And so um, our, we provide services throughout these mental health regions. Um, in addition to our, our, our crisis line uh, and the follow-up services that we provide on that, we also provide uh, mobile crisis outreach. Um, and so our mobile crisis outreach teams operate 365, 24 seven, and those consist of two counselors, um, our program is made up of um, individuals who do it on call for us. So we have kind of a wide pool of professional background providing our mobile crisis outreach services. Uh, those can range from professional counselors and therapists to school counselors, to medical staff, um, social workers, substance use counselors. Um, so, so when someone calls for our mobile crisis team, they're gonna get a really unique mix of personnel. We also include peers in our mobile crisis team. Um, these individuals are going out. Um, we serve 11 counties in eastern Iowa, and it, it really constitutes a mixture of urban, urban for Iowa, which is, isn't probably urban in a lot of other states, as well as very rural um, ag communities. So uh, there are uh, kind of a wide array of individuals that our mobile crisis teams are serving as they're coming and going. And, and our, our mobile crisis teams are available both for youth and adults in crisis. Um, in addition to that, we also have uh, embedded crisis counselors within uh, various law enforcement departments in Eastern Iowa. And so these individuals are going out sometimes directly with law enforcement, sometimes they're being called out by law enforcement, and they are providing services to individuals with uh, the goal of diverting them away, in, individuals in crisis, with the goal of diverting them away from um, unnecessary interaction with the criminal justice system, as well as um, unnecessary hospitalizations. Uh, law enforcement in, in, in Iowa, they, they have a tough, tough task and they're called out for virtually everything. So these counselors are really there to support them, as well as provide more effective treatment for individuals than what they may have traditionally received. Um, in addition to that, Foundation Two does some work, uh, quite a bit of work in the schools. Our mobile crisis teams frequently uh, visit local schools, hospital ERs, um, we, we go out sometimes to do some grief work um, after suicides have occurred in our communities um, and, and then uh, collaborating pretty closely with EMS and uh, law enforcement. In addition to that, Iowa has started to open up these access centers. Um, some folks on here are probably familiar with the mental health access centers. These are uh, community collaboratives in which individuals in law enforcement can bring an individual to in crisis and services are not really siloed. So they can walk through the door, they're immediately greeted by one of our crisis counselors who provides triage services, and then we're basically taking them right down the hallway to substance use providers, crisis stabilization units, medical providers, um, there's detox on site. So it's a really cool model. It's very new in Iowa. I know a lot of other states have had these for, for, for periods of time but that is kind of the other area that we are um, now utilizing our crisis services within. Um, so we're, we're super excited to be here today and we look forward to, uh, to talking with everyone. Thank you, Drew. Before we get into our first poll question, I just wanna mention that uh, the, the Q&A uh, is uh, the best place to not just submit your questions, uh, but to also uh, chat any comments or any feedback that you have um, and we'd love to, to share that if it's relevant to um, kind of the flow of what we've got going on today. So I am now going to um, pull up our first poll of the day. Okay, 
Um, the first poll says true or false. There is overwhelming research evidence that psychiatric hospitals produce superior outcomes to other crisis services. So go ahead and um, uh, vote on that here. And I'll give you just about uh, 30 seconds or so to vote. I can kind of see when, when votes are coming in. Good, we've already had over half of you respond. That's fantastic. All right, almost three quarters, wonderful. Just a couple more seconds. Okay, all right, so we're gonna close this poll. And I will share the results here. All right, 98% of you said that you think that that statement is false, that there is not overwhelming research evidence that psychiatric hospitals produce superior outcomes to crisis services. Okay, thank you for voting. Uh, we'll have a couple more opportunities to do that. Um, so here is what the research shows on crisis uh, residential programs, first of all, compared to psychiatric hospitalization. Uh, there are over 35 studies from the past 40 years that are supporting uh, triple aim objectives of a crisis residential unit. And what that means is uh, triple aim in healthcare means uh, client experience, population health, and cost. So in this case, these articles demonstrate higher client satisfaction and better outcomes and lower cost. Uh, a quote from one of the articles you can see here says that outcomes for psychiatric symptoms and strengths tended to show greater mean improvement for crisis residential programs, and four outcomes showed superior gains among CRP uh, patients, especially for psychosis. Um, so there is quite a body of evidence behind the crisis services that we use today, and these weren't created uh, recently. There's been long-standing experience that these are effective uh, methods of treatment. Um, you know, the, the existence of mobile crisis teams goes back uh, decades, at least to the 70s. Uh, the existence of assertive community treatment teams, um, of these programs, that they, they have a long history. They, and, and I think suicide prevention hotlines, the first one was started in 1958 um, in Los Angeles. So, these have been around for a long time, and we have to remember um, how they work and why they work and, and kind of what the research shows us. Um, Alex alluded to this in, in her uh, practice-based evidence, right, in her experience um, operating a peer respite, that peer respite programs actually show uh, uh, these uh, similar outcomes, and there is more recent research that's, that's shown around peer respite programs providing triple aim solutions not just in cost savings from avoided psychiatric hospitalizations, but if you're catching the person at the first part of their crisis before the crisis exacerbates or gets, you know, just gets much uh, larger or compounds, um, you can also save on, on trips to the emergency department. Um, this is a, a quote from one of the papers related to psychiatric hospitalization, and it said, for those that used the respite program, uh, their hospital costs were about $1,000 compared to $3,000 for non-users. So that just means that it's diminishing the need to use the psychiatric hospital at all, or when you do, that the cost and the length of stay would be much less. So let's go into our second poll question. And um, I just hope you all know this is really uh, testing this, the limits of my technical capabilities. So if this works, I will be, you know, very pleasantly surprised, but that's part of why I have Miranda here to, um, to, to, to keep me up. Okay, so this question uh, says, what determines the presence of a crisis? And your options are a crisis is defined by a set of clinical criteria. The second is a crisis is defined by the person experiencing the crisis. And the third is it's complicated. So, uh, again, we'll take just about 15 more seconds to um, have people vote, and then we'll show those results, and that will inform the next question for our panelists. Okay, three more seconds. Great, and let me go ahead and share those results. <clears throat> so
So um, almost 80% of you answer that a crisis is defined by the person experiencing the crisis. Um, and then a little less than 20% of you said it's complicated. Uh, and then uh, a handful of you said that a crisis is defined by clinical criteria. Great, thank you for participating. That's gonna lead us in to this next question, which I will now um, bring to our panelists, which is when, when do you believe a crisis starts and when does a crisis end? And then how do the function of your organization's crisis services align with these definitions? So. Uh, Drew, you were the last one that I um, introduced, uh, so why don't we have you go first on this question. When do you think a crisis starts and when does a crisis end? So this is a, this is a great question. <clears throat> and uh, our executive director, Emily Bloom at Foundation Two, um, has certainly advocated strongly for client perception and client meaning around crises. And so a, a crisis starts when a client says a crisis starts and a crisis ends when there's, uh, you know, uh, obviously there's feedback from the client and there's some return to um, the ability to manage or effectively cope with whatever that precipitating event is. In the training with our, our crisis staff, we uh, frequently cite um, kind of that crisis trilogy that you'll see out there in a lot of the literature, that there's a precipitating event, a, a subject, subjective distress, and then a failure of coping mechanisms, but the real emphasis is on the subjective distress. And so, uh, we, uh, a part of our philosophy, we don't tell a client when they're in crisis and when they're not, they tell us um, and they communicate to that, that to us on the crisis line or in our mobile crisis contacts. Um, so I would say our, uh, the function of our organization's crisis services align pretty closely with um, the majority of definitions I see out there, especially in crisis related literature around um, the importance of client perception. And I, I also think that, that kind of definition is backed up by kind of a long line of both psychology and philosophy. You could follow kind of a trail all the way back from Marcus Aurelius to Albert Ellis and Aaron Beck, and of course the work of um, Eric Lindemann after the, the Coconut Grove Night Fire in the 1940s, which was um, kind of a, a, a early research on crisis intervention. So uh, that's where our philosophy aligns and that's how we train our staff and that's also how we interact with the, the clients that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you, Drew. Um, uh, I appreciate all of the historical references and I've, I think I have my college uh, psychology textbooks right back here. So I'm gonna be diving into those after this and being like, okay, I gotta get back into Alice a little bit. Um, <laughs> uh, Alex, uh, how about you? When do you believe a crisis starts and when does a crisis end? So I agree with um, with Drew's uh, definition of that and and how he presented that. I, it's it really is based on the the consumer. It, for us, is based on the guest when they approach us and they describe how they're feeling. We really work with them on that and talk to them and and do our best to bring them in um, based on how they're feeling. You know, as we mentioned, um, we are we work with individuals who are. Um, who are experiencing the symptoms and the behaviors that put you in the direction of a crisis. Um, so it can, it, it looks different and there's, there's large variations. Um, one thing that I, that I wanted to mention is the wellness and recovery center is actually a non-medical peer respite facility as well. So we do not do, we don't have licensed clinicians on staff. We don't diagnose and, or, um, make clinical determinations. Um, I, I myself do assessments and the staff are all trained um, to assess during intake, but we really leave it up to the client to determine how they're feeling and work with them based on that. Um, and so I have learned and what we have educated the community on is that a crisis begins when the symptoms start. So when you start to show those behaviors or the effects start to present themselves, I said, okay, well, you might be under that umbrella um, of, of a crisis approaching. And so we then interact with them based on those needs. Um, how that differs from our organization is actually extremely unique. Um, so the Wellness and Recovery Center is a program under the umbrella of Neighborhood Properties. Neighborhood Properties has been an agency in Lucas County that has housed homeless individuals for, I think we're coming up on 33 years. So um, I always say 30 years because that's easier, but we have been housing homeless individuals in Lucas County for about 30 years 
um, specifically those individuals who are living with severe um, and persisting mental illness or are in some sort of recovery or um, looking to get into some sort of substance or alcohol use recovery. Um, so that's what we did. That was our thing. We, we got really good at it. Um, we've housed, we have over 600 apartments in the community um, and it's permanent supportive housing. So we provide them with an apartment for as long as they need and then provide them with staff to address those skills. Um, that eventually became peer staff to address those skills. Um, and we really enjoyed working with the peer staff and really saw a difference in the outcomes. Um, once we um, included peer staff um, and the, the county decided, let's get a peer respite going. Um, so crisis services and housing were two different things. You know, housing is mental health. Housing is a mental health resource. Housing is health care. I, I, I would scream that from the mountaintops if I could. Um, and so neighborhood properties decided we were going to get a peer respite um, center going, um, which is different, um, but it's extremely unique. So we have really educated the organization on um, crisis services and what that looks like for the housing clients, provided them with a resource for the housing clients, um, and really trying to teach the community that um, there are signs and there's things that you can look out for and that should be included in crisis services care. Thank you, Alex. Donna, same question to you. When do you believe a crisis starts and when does a crisis end? Um, my co-panelists have it right on the head. Uh, the folks who feel that they are in a crisis, they're in a crisis. Now, we do have some supportive uh, caregivers support people for them who who might also recognize that this person is going into a crisis or has uh, developed a, a crisis state and they may be the ones who are reaching out to us uh, for some assistance I mean you can't you can't get away from the caring person who who really wants to give their their person some um, some help um, but I think that you know it doesn't necessarily mean they're at a suicidal point may not even be feeling like they're going to harm themselves or somebody else but uh, if someone is just feeling that they're they're not on uh, at, at their their best that that's a, maybe a crisis to them whereas somebody else may not even recognize that point that uh, they've gone beyond what most people would would say is a crisis so we deal with them through our agency in a number of uh, different levels uh, both through uh, maybe a helpline and somebody's identifying that for the first time, they're, they're not sure what's going on and they need some education. And so uh, the crisis line folks are, are assisting them and you know, kind of identifying that, that that is what's happening. So it may be some education that we're providing and then they uh, recognize this, yeah, this is a crisis, I need some more help rather than just you know, trying, to, trying to push through this. Um, or it may be that the law enforcement is part of it as well. And when the clinicians assist with law enforcement on, on helping somebody um, understand that there's something that needs to happen before this person gets hurt or, uh, or is out there in an unsafe environment, then that's a crisis for, for the person to recognize. So it's a, it's a, a wide variety of, of um, where, where does it start? Where does it end? When the person says they're feeling better, and we may not always agree with that, we may say, "Okay, you know, I you've made these strides," and again, helping them kind of work through what is, what, what was their goal in getting crisis services, and do they feel like they've met that goal? Um, it may not be if we felt that we've met it with them or that they've met it, but you know, it, it's got to be that person determining. For themselves that okay I, I don't need this kind of support anymore maybe I need ongoing help and and connections and uh, established uh, ongoing services but uh, but the crisis is is over I'm feeling much better I'm I'm ready to go on with more supportive kinds of things and not just the the intensive kinds of services um, and I feel that our organizations crisis services align pretty much with with that uh, again it's a gamut of various services and so it may be you know one one program uh, follows that definition whereas another program may not uh, entirely because they are required to intervene um, due to person's harm harmful statements or statements about self-harm or something else so they might have to take that extra step and, and intervene when the person doesn't really necessarily recognize it themselves so yeah 
I, I really appreciate Don actually mentioning mentioning goals, client goals, and it. I think that especially in the context of Windows at crisis end, uh, it, you know, crisis care should be client centered. That's what we're trying to do, and I think that's a really important component. And there's a lot of times where we work with clients in crisis where their goals might not necessarily align with my goals, and and not but in the name of crisis services we are client centered. So ultimately we're looking at what the client's goals are in most circumstances. In, in most cases, there's some exceptions to that, but in most cases, that's really critical to when the crisis ends. This is a question for, for any of you to answer, but do you have instances where um, accessing crisis services for a person, um, in addition to being helpful just by the, the methods that you use to intervene or provide treatment, uh, provides relief from other contributing factors uh, that led to the crisis, which when the person leaves crisis services, they are then entering back into some of those triggers or some of those, those um, you know, uh, toxic situations, which immediately puts them at risk of crisis again. And if so, how do you handle that? Well, so um, I, I, can, I can jump in. I think we're all, <laughs> that's a complicated question because crisis services, are a piece of the puzzle of a system that needs to be in place to support an individual. And there are many clients, you know, where, where they come out of a crisis and because of environmental circumstances, whether that is poverty or whether that is other socioeconomic status, they are put back into the situation that at least compounded, if not directly contributed to that initial crisis. And so uh, that is one of the hard parts, I think, of working in crisis services, especially for our frontline staff or staff that are out there, is to try to struggle with what is the long, kind of the, in some of these circumstances, they're always contextual, but I wish we could do more. I, you know, as, as Alex was mentioning, housing is a critical issue virtually everywhere you go in homelessness. And it makes sense if you don't have safe, affordable, clean housing that you are going to face crisis situations frequently. So there are there are other pieces of the system here that that certainly have to be in place for a community to have a really robust outcome for some of these individuals. I also think that um, having meaningful follow up care is something that has been a struggle for some communities. I see my co panelists nodding their head. It's been a struggle for some communities and what that follow up care looks like. Um, most communities are operating as best they can with what they have. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes that meaningful follow-up care falls between the cracks. Um, although I know that there's so many places that are working to improve those things. And sometimes it doesn't look like, um, you know, at the Wellness Center, our follow-up care can be a, a, um, sending you a card. Um, as Donna mentioned, follow-up care is having that Thanksgiving dinner. That's still some sort of follow-up care that is non-traditional um, and it can sometimes be considered more welcoming, um, which in turn can provide um, a positive response from the community member that has received your services. Um, one of the things at the Wellness and Recovery Center is that um, when we engage with community members and when they come in, you know, they're blown away because we've provided them an environment that makes them feel safe and dignified. I know not everybody has the ability to do that. I think in, in the beginning slide, there was a picture and that is what the inside of the Wellness and Recovery Center looks like and that's consistent. We want to continue that as they leave and so provide them with that dignified follow-up care um, that they may not have experienced in other parts of crisis services or mental health care. Um, and that doesn't mean that those other programs are less valuable, but providing them with another option um, can sometimes change um, how they feel and how they interact with the community. And you're right, I mean, most of the time, um, and I believe there was a question for me, individuals can stay at the Wellness Center for up to seven days. Um, that again is their own decision. So if somebody comes in, they've interacted with us and they said, hey, Alex, I feel a lot better and I'd like to go home and it's only been three days, that's great. You're making that decision for yourself and I'm gonna, I'm gonna support you in doing that. Um, some others like to stay the full seven days. Um, but, you know, after they leave the Wellness and Recovery Center, we, we still want to provide that dignified service um, of maybe we're sending them a nice letter. Maybe I'm giving them a call on a day that I know um, they have trouble with if it's an anniversary date. Sometimes people come into the center because, you know, the, the, 
day that they lost their mother is coming up and it's been five years, you know, I may give them a call just to check in and see how they're doing. Um, so we, re we really want to provide them with that dignified service all the way through. And I know follow-up care can sometimes be a challenge for community mental health agencies because we're all overworked, you know, and there's a large number of people to serve and it's nearly impossible to get to them all and get them quality service at the same time. But um, I think that that is gonna be something that's really important when we talk about crisis services from the beginning to the end. That follow-up care is really that end piece. And how you know, were they presented with the distressing situation again in the community and how did they respond? Did it bring them back to the hospital? Did it bring them back to us at the wellness center? Or were they able to use those tools that we provided them? One of the one of the challenges that I think crisis providers have historically faced is only being in control of one part of the crisis continuum or the behavioral health services continuum. And you might see some great progress in someone and you know that you've gotten to know them over seven, 10, 14 days, and you might have some really good ideas on, on what would be the next best thing for them as far as continuity of care and ongoing treatment. But you don't control that. Somebody else gets paid to do that. And, and so you might, you might feel, man, I wish there was something else we could do. We're seeing that change now with 988 legislation that's saying we're going to pay for phone calls and for follow-up outreach calls. You're seeing this in the, in the design of the mobile crisis teams that say we will absolutely follow up with you for 30 days. And that can change the tone of a, a crisis experience, make the, the positive effects last longer. And like you said, Alex, just be human to them. Right. Like show them that you care, treat them like uh, like somebody who is important and valued. Uh, that goes back to the Dr. Jerome model studies with the caring contacts from 40 years ago, uh, where he's following up with people who are suicidal at the hospital with just a non committal or, or non um, action oriented outreach that just says, hey, we care about you and we hope you're doing well. And it had tremendous impacts on suicide prevention. So Donna, I want to give you a chance to answer uh, the same question about um, uh, you know, the, the, the danger or the challenge that can come with people going back into the environment that caused, that contributed to the crisis in the first place. Yeah, we see that. And we see exactly what both Alex and Drew have said, particularly when Drew was talking about wanting to do more and, and not being able to have the time to get somebody connected when you know that if if there were a little bit more time that you had with them, you could make some bigger changes. Um, two weeks is not enough time to get somebody connected with the social security uh, disability benefits, and it's not enough time to get sometimes your ID uh, recovered, or or so that enables you to go further then in the community. So it we do try to um, help folks get a a warm handoff to some clinician in maybe one of the outpatient clinics that we use. It doesn't always happen. Um, and if that's not the case, then we try to at least get them an appointment for follow-up care in our hospital district. We've got a pretty good working partnership with uh, Harris Health, uh, which is the the public hospital uh, district of, Houston, uh, of Harris County. Um, so knowing that we can't do it all, and knowing that it's not necessarily in our purview to do it all, but to know that there's somebody else out there that we can connect them to, that will help. Not, doesn't always, and people, you know, are there, they are autonomous individuals. They, they have their own determinations and the, their own ideas, and when they get a stimulus check, uh, they're gonna go off and use that stimulus check rather than use it for something that's perhaps more appropriate for them that we would think would be more appropriate, but it it does certainly um, yeah yeah it makes you think what what more could we do if we had more time or more resources or or something like that that nature. Mm -hmm. I uh, well, I was just going to say please. kind of piggybacking on that uh, successful crisis services require significant community buy-in and uh, going up with what Alex and Donna was saying. Having referrals that are responsive to your crisis teams can really help to, I mean, you know, there's, there's, I think, some early research on mobile crisis teams that shows stuff around efficacy and connecting to referrals. And that is part of that follow-up piece and especially critical for uh, clients that they're able to actually connect with the referral sources that are being given to them by crisis providers. We found that, and I'm sure many other people have too, to be a really critical component. And to get that responsiveness from, from folks that we don't have control over 
requires really community support for what you're doing, especially from within the behavioral health spectrum in your community. We had a comment come in from Helen Ryder, which I'd like to kind of turn into a question. And, and I don't know who this applies to, um, but it has to do with insurance um, and, and defining a crisis. So, you know, Alex, my understanding of peer respite, one of the benefits is that um, most of them are not paid for with Medicaid funds and therefore don't follow like a reimbursement format or have um, really strict like paperwork and guidelines that can um, just weigh the rest of us down who are working in other parts of crisis services. They're often grant funded, funded by a tax levy, um, by a millage, some other uh, creative solution that I probably reduces the barriers between the person who wants to serve and the person who, who needs help um, by, by being more present. So maybe for, for Drew or Donna, I don't know if you, you experienced this, but the comment that, uh, that Helen gave was that the definition of a crisis is much different for an insurance uh, company than what the client might say for a person who's, that's in crisis. Do you ever have these issues in you know, utilization management or continuing stay reviews or even just authorization if, if it's a, um, let's say a mobile crisis service to say where, where the, the funder is saying one thing and the person is, is presenting it very differently or is having a different experience um, than, than the perception of the, ins of the insurer or the funder? If so, how do you handle that? Well, I have to say that in the crisis residential uh, programs, we don't bill uh, insurance for the programs. We do get funding through uh, the state grants and, and, and such. So in our case, it's not really an issue, although we certainly hear people need to move on. It's time for them to move on. It's been two weeks, three weeks now, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I do hear about it in outpatient clinics and some of the other uh, services um, and we've got staff who are better at arguing for the patient and advocating on their behalf uh, than others uh, but yeah well, fortunately I don't have to to mess with that perhaps Drew has more experience with that um, I, I don't we, we don't bill insurance either we use braided funding and we're, we're very fortunate in that regard and, and that's in my opinion how it should be um, with the current way that our our, our structure works within the state, our Medicaid structure, we, we would not be able to operate, do right by the clients if we were to try to utilize that as a funding revenue stream for our mobile crisis or crisis services. It, it just has so far to go in terms of being like a reality to fund our, fund our team. So uh, I don't have much experience with that either. Okay. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy for all of you on this panel and I also sympathize for all of my uh, crisis colleagues who do work in those fee-for-service environments that, in addition to just the inherent challenges of crisis work, they're also having to, uh, you know, do a lot of advocacy to get a, get a stay extended by a few days or to, quote-unquote, prove that a person's crisis is continuing just because, for example, they're no longer suicidal, you know, and still having to say, but that doesn't mean that we're in, we're in a great place where this person's ready to discharge. So um, this is great. We've got some questions continuing to come in and we will uh, be fielding them either as we go or in the last uh, 15 minutes or so. Uh, so we're going to go to our third poll question. And let me just go ahead and get this loaded up. Um, okay. Third poll question says, under what conditions do you believe it is appropriate to refuse someone for crisis services? I apologize for the grammatical error there. Um, and you can choose more than one in this instance. So verbally abusive or threatening, uh, internal stimuli or delusional, physically aggressive or a history of aggression, suicidal thoughts with a plan or other. And if you click other, then once we close this poll, if you wouldn't mind just uh, typing what your other is, into the questions box so we can share that as well. So um, we've got some people voting, great. I'm gonna give it about 10 to 15 more seconds and then we'll close the poll.
All right, three more seconds. And we will close it. Great. All right, and now I'm sharing the results up here. <laughs> and my, here, I'm gonna try and pull this up a little bit so I have a fighting chance at reading it because my, my font is very small. Okay, under what conditions do you believe it is appropriate to refuse someone for crisis services? 42% um, of the people said physically aggressive or history of aggression. 30% uh, said verbally abusive or threatening. 9% uh, said suicidal thoughts with a plan. Um, and then about 37% said other. So I'm gonna I'm gonna hop into the chat. Uh, some people also said emergency medical needs, um, actual threat or uh, contemporary evidence of physical violence. Um, and then we have someone who says, I think no one should be refused crisis services. Um, so that's gonna lead us into uh, the, the framing of our next question here. So one of the documents that I, I shared uh, of the, the monographs about crisis services is this uh, best practices toolkit, the, the national guidelines for, for behavioral health crisis care, which was published by SAMHSA uh, in the spring of 2020. And this is a quote that comes from the introduction section of that paper. It says, given the ever expanding inclusion of the term crisis by entities describing service offerings that do not truly function as a no wrong door safety net service, um, we must start by defining what crisis services are and what they are not. Crisis services are for anyone, anytime, and anywhere. So our next set of questions for the panelists are, under what conditions would you not serve someone in crisis? And does having admission criteria compromise your identity as a crisis provider? Um, Alex, I will start with you. Okay, thank you. And Travis, I, um, I don't know if it's still my screen, but we're still on the poll question. Um, I am so sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that you said something. Um, it could also be possible my computer was slow. <laughs> no, I, th I think you're right. I think you're right. So just, just so everyone saw um, <laughs> what we were looking at before, this was uh, our information about from SAMHSA, the National Guidelines Toolkit, uh, which is leading us into our question right here. So thank you, Alex. Under what conditions would you not serve someone in crisis? So we know that SAMHSA toolkit well at CRA. Um, <laughs> and so at the Wellness and Recovery Center, again, our program is, is unique. And when we, when we wrote the program um, and designed it, it was meant to be non-medical um, as a means for our community members to feel potentially less intimidated um, by the services and by receiving help. But what that also means is that we are not an appropriate resource for someone whose medical need may be a bit higher. Um, we don't do medication management here. Anybody who comes into the wellness center, if they are on any kind of medication, they must have the ability to manage those things independently. Now, that does not mean that I will not make accommodations. Again, the goal is to help as many people as we can, as best we can. We are a confidential facility. So it is a locked door and that not anybody can come in. So your mom or your brother can't come in to give you your morning meds, but your caseworker may be able to. If you have a home health aide, they can do those things. So we were able to make that accommodation so that we can say, okay, you can have your support provider come in and administer those medications if you potentially can't do those on your own. Um, another um, way in which we might have to refer somebody out, I hate to say deny, I, language is important. We may not be the appropriate option for you at the moment. Let's refer you to this agency and then we can welcome you back. Another reason we may have to refer somebody out is if they are actively using drugs or alcohol. Again, we are not a uh, resource that can manage withdrawal symptoms um, or um, the after effects of somebody who comes in the door and they are actively using drugs or alcohol. The staff are trained to recognize those, recognize those things and again, appropriately refer, um, but it is not something that we can manage throughout the duration of your stay. Um, additionally, aggression um, and violence, that is something that we cannot accept while you are within the center. If somebody is showing signs of potential aggression, we, have, we are trained to be able to work through that and, and de-escalate that that does not result 
and somebody having to be asked to leave or to be transferred to a more a higher level of care. Um, but if there is physical aggression while within the center, um, or if there has been physical aggression um, prior to coming into the center, um, there are times where we do have to refer to a higher level of care um, and then work with that provider to then welcome that person back. So if somebody has to, if they're presenting with um, uh, drug use, you know, and, and I have to say, well, we can't accept you at the moment, but how about I refer you to one of the other agencies in the community? I will then contact that agency and say, you know, when that person is done with you, how about you welcome them back? They can come back to the center. They will have gone through those withdrawal symptoms and they are more medically stable to be able to engage with us. So if I can't welcome you right away, I will try to get you on the back end and, and offer, you know, how about you stay with us for as many days as you need? Because you're likely not ready to go back home. And so you're going to need another um, maybe step down environment to come into. And so we try to provide that to them. Language, language, language. I hate to say deny. Um, I understand that we have to keep them safe. They're our top priority. And so whatever is safest for you and for the staff, um, that's what we're going to do. Um, but we really try to work with them as best we can. Uh, Alex, what I think is different about you about how you're describing um, <laughs> uh, being helpful in different ways through referrals mm -hmm. of other services is that you're still taking ownership in right. the person's crisis and accessing the right level of care, even if it's not you. You're not just saying no and hanging up the phone. You're asking that question: How can we be the most helpful? It's not going to be in our, you know, within our four walls, but that doesn't mm -hmm. mean we can't get you connected to the right, and and sometimes that's just as helpful. I don't know if I heard you mention this, but um, if a person is homeless, can they stay at the peer, at your peer respite facility? And if if not, why not? So uh, when we opened, and um, up until I want to say the last few days, our model was that incoming clients had to have some sort of stable housing. We needed to ensure that we were not releasing you back into the community, into an unstable environment to potentially undo some of the things we had done. That has been a complex issue that as a program manager, director, I continue to address and assess with the um, guidance of our county board and the leadership within our organization, because the ho homeless in our community, homelessness in our community is near and dear to neighborhood properties heart and my heart, and it just didn't feel right that we could not service them in, in any kind of way. We do still have criteria in place, but our goal um, is to help as many people as we can as best we can. And I think while it's just as important to make sure that we are referring to appropriate organizations and resources, it's also important that as um, programs like the Wellness Center and other programs in the country, we continue to assess what we are providing and how we are providing it and adapt and adjust and, and progress. And so in that progression, I, while I am um, committing myself to the growth and the wellness of the client that's coming in the door, I'm also committing myself to the growth of our organization and our, of our practice. And so um, it is a goal to be able to then service the, the community, those who are unhoused in our community or maybe don't have as many stable home environments. So yes and no is the answer to that. <laughs> okay. Um, Drew, I want to bring this over to you because the services that you oversee as director are a little bit different than the ones that Alex and Donna oversee. And so uh, denial or, or conditions that you wouldn't serve a person in crisis might be a little bit different for a call center and a mobile crisis team. Can you tell us about those? When, when do you have to um, kind of take a stand and say, we can't serve this person or we can't serve them at this at this moment it's a it's a great question it's a, a complicated question um, for the most part there are to, to utilize our service on the surface like our mobile crisis teams you just have to be physically located in the region that we serve that mental health region which is a group of, of counties that's the only requirement we have we do ask uh, clients have to volunteer, have to want our service. We don't go where we're not asked. That's just a part of our philosophy with our mobile crisis teams in particular. Um, <clears throat> that said, as an organization, we also have a, a responsibility to do all we can to keep the people doing this work safe and um, as well as clients safe. So there are times where if a client is um, physically violent, uh, we may try to get our law enforcement liaison out there instead of our mobile crisis team, if at all possible. 
Um, and then the the other aspect to that is uh, counselors are a finite service or a finite service, a finite resource. And so there are times where we have to triage calls based on our own criteria um, in order to, uh, to to utilize our, our our counselors, you know, most most effectively. Um, we, we use criteria that is, I, I think, pretty standard in the field, but but those would be really the only time um, we might, you know, restrict or do some modification to that. Uh, it's a question I get asked a lot about, especially about uh, our mobile crisis teams. Have there has there ever been any violence directed at them? And uh, it, we've been doing this since 2003. We've never had an incident um, with our mobile crisis. I mean, we've had kids like throw orange juice at us and stuff like that. But we've never had an incident with a, a counselor getting into some kind of physical altercation or something like that with a client. So, so there's very few reasons we would deny service to an individual, um, and and we would try to connect them again with either our law enforcement liaisons or um, a community partner to serve them if we were unable to for some reason. Thank you, Drew. Uh, Donna, same question over to you. Um, are there conditions when you would not serve someone in crisis in one of the crisis programs at the Harris Center? In the crisis residential programs, yes, there are definitely medical criteria that we would expect people to be able to, um, to kind of uh, uh, self uh, or exclude from a referral because we're getting referrals from other people, mostly uh, professionals in hospitals and of our, our clinics. So if they're referring someone to us, they have a, a, a list of things that we really could not safely provide a service for. Um, an example would be very high blood pressure that somebody doesn't have under control with medications or um, their diabetes is not under control and they might be you know, at risk of, of having um, uh, problems when they're with us. Um, advanced pregnancy would be another thing. We, we really are careful about how far along somebody is or how just how medically uh, involved someone is. Because we don't, like Alex said, we don't have the medical trained staff there. We've got a lot of uh, uh, staff who are trained in de-escalating behaviors and helping somebody uh, deal with their anxiety issues and and minor medical things that they can take care of for the most part of themselves that we can work with that. Um, but if we do have someone who is aggressive or threatening or uh, violent, we fortunately have other parts of the agency who can either work with us um, and help them provide that service in their location or they uh, are asked to be serviced at one of the emergency hospitals or something like that, which has a better staffing level, more trained staff, and the ability to to really intervene with a, a, an issue. Um, we try not to deny somebody who has been there and maybe hasn't made the progress that we would like them to make in the past. Uh, we'll, we'll accept them back certainly and, and work with them on, okay, what's different this time? How can we work with you and, you know, move you, move you along? But uh, it also seems that if it's someone who just, um, you know, has been there before and we, we kind of have a do not serve note for some people, they, somebody stole somebody's car, uh, the nurse's car and she doesn't want to see that person again, uh, which I kind of, you know, I understand that. Um, and someone who might have attacked a, a staff person or another client or something and and not gotten the kind of help that that we could see has made a big difference. So there may be some individual kinds of, of restrictions we would place on, on readmitting somebody. But um, yeah, for the most part, we, we really do try to provide the, the services uh, gambit as, as we can. And if we can't serve them, try to find somebody else in the community, like Alex was saying, to, to work with them instead of us. Donna, the car hijacking was a very specific hypothetical situation. I just want to know that. <laughs> um. <laughs> um, we don't have to go into it anymore. Um, uh, so let me ask this question then to all of you, and, and anybody can feel free to, to answer, and it goes back to this the, the second part of this, this slide question here. Do you think that having uh, exclusionary criteria 
um, compromises your identity as a crisis provider because you don't technically serve everyone all the time. I don't think so. Um, I think that it challenges the definition of crisis, of, of who a crisis provider is and what a crisis is. Um, I think that um, it does not exclude us from being able to consider ourselves as crisis providers because we are educating um, the community and individuals um, on what a crisis looks like. So um, I think that for the Wellness and Recovery Center specifically, especially considering we're a non-medical practice, we do challenge the idea of what a crisis looks like when it starts and when it ends um, because we do define ourselves as a crisis provider. Um, although we cannot provide, um, we, we cannot accept based on certain criteria or may refer out to then welcome back. What, I would what I'm, go ahead, agree with that. Yeah, I, no, I would agree with that. I, I think that we, uh, you know, there are all kinds of crises and there are all kinds of definitions of, of a person's crises. And um, I, I think if we can, uh, uh, show that we're also trying to educate someone on how they can manage their own crisis or maybe rethink what is going on with them and, and uh, find a find their own definition of a crisis. I, I think we, we manage fairly well to uh, go through that the criteria. And again, if we can't serve them directly at that time, we'll try to find somebody who can. What I've heard in all of your answers is that you have to carry risk in one hand and humanity in the other or or a, a humanistic perspective in the other. And if it's in a residential program, we're talking about the milieu. Um, if you've ever been in a class that has like one jokester um, in grad school, that was probably me, where like the class can only move as fast as the as the most difficult or most challenging person. If you're going to throw someone with with a, a high level of aggression, um, you know, and into a, a 10 or 15 bed unit, you're going to disrupt the ability of of treatment that the other person can receive. And then to Drew's point about safety, um, if if you are if you're not managing your risk by by being able to say on a few rare instances we need to be able to assess whether or determine, decide whether or not we're going to send someone out. Um, you need your staff to be, to, to come home safe and healthy. Um, it's not, go, it's going to be hard to hire people uh, if they, if everybody else that works in those jobs is always at risk. Uh, and in some cases, the, the victim of some kind of aggression or violence or heavy verbal abuse. Um, and so there's, there's a tension. You have to carry these tensions in your hand to be a good crisis provider and perhaps a crisis provider that would truly take everyone that you're talking about um, would have to make to go to such great lengths to do that that you would strip away some of the things that make your programs good. And let's remember, we talked about this in the last webinar, even psychiatric hospitals turn people away. Um, and in some cases, uh, services like yours, Donna, will accept people who have been denied by the psychiatric hospital. I see the face that says, maybe that's happened to you before. So. Um, Thank you. I, I want to get into the general Q&A. We've got about five or 10 minutes uh, here left for questions. Um, the first one that I have uh, that came in for you, Donna, uh, said, can you talk a little bit more about the Chronic Client Stabilization Initiative Program? The CCSI. Uh, we like our acronyms. That's right. Um, that's a, a program where we, they are folks who have come back through, they're through the system, particularly through the emergency uh, uh, hospital system time and time again, have not been real successful in having a, um, a good connection with an ongoing provider, uh, either through our clinics or through a, a private psychiatrist or something. And, and so they are, uh, they get more intensive services with counseling and case managers who really work hard to establish that rapport and trust and thus um, try to try to get them connected on an ongoing basis so that they're not calling for 911 all the time and they're not ending up back in the psychiatric hospital. So it is, um, they are people who have been identified as heavy frequent users without the supports that we would hope that they would be able to rely on 
um, rather than those emergency services. So that's pretty much what it is. Okay. Um, somebody asked uh, if any of y'all have experience with peer support for youth in crisis services, whether that's mobile, uh, peer respite, crisis residential, anything like that. Um, we 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 don't. I don't think we have a youth certification. We do have a family peer support specialist, but those are adults, uh, certified adults in Iowa. So we have some experience with those, but I don't think that that's quite what they're looking for. Uh, but but we have used uh, family support specialists, peer support specialists, which can be an incredible resource because they've they've worked through the system from different perspectives as as a parent, and uh, they can be. Uh, unbelievably beneficial to an individual in crisis who's who's interacting with some sort of system um, with their children or as a family unit. Um, within our county, we do have a youth mobile crisis unit um, that can go out um, as the needs arise. Um, and I know the organization that it's not with internally um, our organization that provides that, but I do believe that they do staff peer supporters. Um, I, they would be adult peer supporters, not, you know, youth or similar in age to the um, client they would be serving. But but that organization does provide peer support and they do have a youth mobile crisis unit, a youth mobile crisis unit. The same here in Harris, uh, Harris County. We have a, a designated uh, unit that would go out to work with with youth who are at that point, you know, needing the, the crisis services, um, but they would not have a peer of their same age. It's, it's adults or family, family peers. Okay. Um, I am not seeing any other questions that have popped in. Uh, I think we've got most of them answered and um, we're coming up right to the end of our time together. So Drew, Alex, Donna, thank you so much for being here. This has been an incredible time to spend together and hear about your programs and the, the wonderful work that you're doing. Uh, we will have a slide here in just a moment that has your contact information. But first, if you are interested in further learning about what we've been talking about today, uh, feel free to email info at tbdsolutions.com. We have a page called something to read, something to watch, something to listen to, which can kind of uh, dive in a little bit more on some of these topics. Uh, if you'd like to get involved in any of the organizations that we talked about uh, that are sponsoring this uh, event, the, the webinar series, uh, CRA, NASCAD, AAS, and the International Council for Helplines, here is their uh, websites. And we will also, um, on the follow-up um, uh, satisfaction survey um, have an option for you to receive more information about them. Lastly, here is the information about reaching today's panelists, um, as well as some social media uh, information if you want to follow the organizations um, or uh, any of us on the Twitter. Uh, so again, thank you so much, uh, panelists. Thank you, attendees, for being here. Uh, you'll receive an email uh, with the, um, the the slides from today's presentation, as well as the recording, which will be posted early next week. Uh, and the slides have also been available in the, um, the GoToWebinar platform. So if you didn't get a chance to access them, uh, we, will, we will still send those. So thanks everyone for being here. It's been a pleasure. Uh, enjoy the rest of your week. And we look forward to seeing you on May 27th for the final installation of our Mythbusters Crisis Webinar Series. Take care, everyone. Thanks for Thank having so us. Much.